Hey friends, welcome back to another Field and Garden podcast. It's your host and friend, Lisa Mason Ziegler. And hey, thanks for punching punching the button this morning to, to join me here. And friends, I'm telling you, you better prepare your hearts because your farming and gardening life is about to change if you listen to this entire podcast. Because it changed my life years ago when I made this discovery, and I am just so pleased today to have a friend, a team member, um, and also, I don't want to, um, she was, is, has been a master gardener, gardener, master naturalist for a really long time, Rhonda Graves. Hey, Rhonda. Hey, Lisa. So thank you so much for joining me here today to talk about something that is so near and dear to me and you, right? Bugs, for sure. insects. For right? sure. I think that's how we bonded. <laughs> it's true. It is so really true. So friends, this is going to be a casual conversation of Rhonda and I basically trying to control ourselves to not go deep on every little morsel of this. Um, but I think that Rhonda and I share this fascination of discovering this world of insects and what's going on under our feet and in the shrubs and the trees and the plants. And y'all, once you go here, you're never going to be able to turn back. So either turn us off if you don't want to learn about really how this world works um, or, you know, join us and come along. So Rhonda, tell us, how did you kind of come to have such an appreciation and an interest in insects and bugs? We call them bugs, which is really a general term. That's kind of an affectionate name we have. That's not an official name, right? So tell us your story of how that started for you, kind of. I think just being in the garden and uh, observing things on flowers and, you know, of course, like most gardeners, I think I was always looking for the pests that are going to, you know, devour my plant to the, to the bottom. Um, But I started to notice um, that there were a lot of insects out there doing things um, for us in the garden. And they weren't general, they usually were in the wrong place at the wrong time when someone was said, something's eating my plant. And quite often they were the good guys there to, to help out and uh, keep those bad guys uh, under control. So, um, and I love taking pictures. So I love, uh, and then most of them are done on my phone. Um, so I have mastered the macro on my phone and I love iNaturalist. So I really geek out over the whole thing, trying to find out what they are, what they do, where they live, what they eat, you know, that kind of thing. So. And, you know, in that, it's so funny that when you get to know whether it's a person or a pet, or an insect family, when you find, kind of learn about them, it kind of connects you to them, right? And I can remember the shift for me um, is I witnessed um, some beneficial insects taking down a caterpillar, and which was a bad, I, I knew enough to know that caterpillars were like devouring, you know, my plant. Um, And when I kind of just happened upon, I think like probably you did, of this whole world of nature that is made to work together. Think of links in a chain, right? I mean, everybody has a job. And when we break that link, it starts screwing things up. But that world was made perfectly to do that. And um, I think when I witnessed I can just remember sitting there and kind of scratching my head, like, what the heck just happened? You know, how did, how did that happen? And who are those? (laughs) And, you know, am I hurting them when I'm, you know, back just very briefly, when I started flower farming 23 years ago, um, I was a master gardener at that time. So I was very familiar with um, IPM, you know, integrated pest management, meaning you always start with the least invasive way to handle a problem. And then you kind of climb the ladder and really target insects. And I was giving it the good girl try, you know, Um, I was following all those steps. But as a flower farmer, commercial grower alone, it was exhausting for me to monitor, to figure out, to treat 
to do all those things. So that's what kind of led me to throw up my hands, right? And just say, all right, y'all, I now understand that there's good bugs and bad bugs, which by the way, is the title of one of our all-time favorite books by Jessica Walliser. Um, and I'll put all this in the show notes um, down below. Good Bug, Bad Bug is a really simple, focused book. Don't you think, Ron, it's the kind of book people could walk out in their garden and ID something, right? Yeah, it's small. It almost fits in your pocket. <laughs> um, and it's got a lot of detail on, yeah, the good guys, the bad guys, and um, yeah, some of the ones you definitely want to have in your garden. Yeah. And it's like, okay, so this is a bad guy. This is what I loved about it. There, this is a bad guy. But do you even need to really do anything about it? Right. I mean, so, um, you know, I kind of stepped back and let nature battle it out, which, you know, I tell that story in Vegetables Love Flowers about how, you know, it's just sometimes when we hit the end of our rope of trying to fix a problem in our garden is when the light comes on. Um, So, Rhonda, tell us um, as a master gardener and a master naturalist, Tell me what you hear as the biggest challenge that people are kind of facing. Like, I mean, they want to just kind of like eliminate everything in their garden, right? Yeah, I think, I think it's like, yay, we, I, get rid of all the insects, all the bugs. Why, why do we need them? But in fact, out of, and we still don't know how many insects are really, a lot of them haven't even been named, things we don't even know or know what they do. But really, I think it's less than 3% that are actual pests that cost us money or cause illness. So most of them are either benign or, or actually um, give us um, services like, of course, pollinators are the number one. Um, You know, when we start thinking about what the pollinators do for us, they give us, what is it? Three out of four bites of everything we eat. I mean, um, we wouldn't have chocolate. (laughs) Yeah. We wouldn't have chocolate without pollinators. Um, and then the predators that for pest control. Um, and then there's the decomposers that help devour the poop and the, um, all the dead leaves and all the wood. They, they break it down so the little guys can, like the bacteria and the fungi, can break it down so it is, can be uptake, you know, taken up by the uh, plant. So without them breaking all that down, and uh, we'd be up to our ears in uh, leaves and poop and dead things. So um, <laughs> there are a lot of services, but when I mean, we start looking at those things, um, I mean, think about the monarch. I mean, everybody loves the monarch. Everybody wants to plant for the monarch. Um, and and that that's great. And for bees, but there's so many other insects out there that need our help. Um, yeah. That so true? bees. That's yeah, like most you're of, the poster child of yes. that group. Exactly. Yeah. Like honeybees. When we need honeybees, they, they do a lot of pollination. They're generalists. They'll, you know, they'll go anywhere. They can fly long distances and they'll pollinate anything pretty much. But there are a lot of specialist bees that we don't even know about. There's some that probably have already gone extinct because we didn't know about them because they specialize on one or two plants maybe and their habitat has disappeared. So they have disappeared too. Um, and there, and there, there are predators and parasitoids that specialize on certain things too. So of course, there are things like praying mantises that'll eat anything um, and everything probably. But then there, are, say, wasps and flies that parasitize. You know, parasitize. Um, yeah, I messed that up. <laughs> that uh, <laughs> take care of things like cucumber beetles. They're flies. Um, that will will lay their eggs on a cucumber beetle or on a squash bug. I mean, who doesn't want those guys in your garden? So, you know, you, so many things that you just said just triggered me. So I want to just quickly, let's just kind of try to, let's try to point out some of these great benefits that would help a lot of different people. So you just talked about parasitic wasps. Wasp. Let's talk about the tomato hornworm, right? That's one, for instance, a lot of people grow tomatoes. Right. So tell them what that looks like, how that little process works. That little, it's a little itty bitty wasp. I think it's less than a quarter inch, maybe an eighth of an inch long. And it's got a little ova poster um, that injects an egg inside the caterpillar. And at that point, you know, that's sad. Um, unless it's, you know, unless it's hornworm and it's on your tomato or on your, uh, 
peppers or whatever, but it lays an egg in there and basically it put an inject. And the good part is it injects chemicals in there that pretty much the, the caterpillar doesn't know anything's going on. It just continues on um, living, but not really doing much else. Um, and then those larvae inside the caterpillar come out as a cocoon. So there's a little, when you see those little white things on the outside of your hornworm, um, you want to just leave them there because the wasp has done its job and you've got lots of little baby wasps that are getting ready to emerge from those cocoons. And hopefully they'll stick around in your garden and take care of all the other guys, all the other hornworms. Because I mean, that's, that's the only one they're going to affect. So. And, but, and that's the goal, right? Is to create this environment um, in your garden where this kind of stuff is happening. So something else you just said reminded me when you were talking about if we didn't have those ground dwellers that kind of process everything that falls to the ground, leaves, all that stuff, um, just reminded me of a story once years ago when I spoke at a conference. And um, it was actually a Master Gardener conference at the University of Maryland. And I was talking about how we add, you know, compost to our beds with each crop rotation, you know, and we give, we use less and less with each passing year, right? And afterwards, this little group of people in the back corner of the conference, I could tell they had something brewing back there. And one of them came and said, could you step back here, please? And I thought, oh boy, what did I say wrong or something, you know? And they said, we, so if we did the math and if you add that much compost, your bed should be like four feet tall by after 20 years because they were missing the part of what you're talking about, about tell us just about who, who are those like ground beetles. Um, those are the kind of guys that digest and compost our stuff basically. Right. Kind of. Right. Yeah. Think, think uh, the roly polies, the uh, well, millipedes, centipedes are, I think centipedes are predators. Millipedes are um, decomposers. Um, your ground beetles, ants, people are like freak out about ants. And it's like, they There's, move more soil and more seeds than anything else <laughs> around. It's um, true. They aerate the soil. They move all those nutrients from the top to the bottom. Um, you know, there's a lot going on down there that we don't know about um, for sure. But, you know, it's, it's all that eating and, and I had to say poop one more time. But anyway, eating <laughs> and pooping, but it's all those nutrients that... I mean, that's how it breaks down so the plant can take it up in that form. So you think, oh, I can pour nitrogen on there. And yes, you can, but it's better to have it processed naturally. Those nutrient recycling, you know, the sun and the plants and the us and yeah. So, you know, we could all break down. We could talk forever about this. <laughs> so I wanted to um, something, I, another book that, and Rhonda has a book that she wants to actually highlight. Another book by my good friend, Jessica Wallace, or she's actually my editor also at my publishers. Um, and she wrote, uh, there's two editions now. It's Attracting Beneficial Bugs to Your Garden. And Jessica is even crazier about bugs than we are. <laughs> and I was looking through her book this morning, just looking for some, you know, little hot tips. And one of the things that a, a beneficial bug that we have a lot of here that, I mean, I kind of knew this, but I didn't really put it all together that she just highlighted. She had a great image of a soldier beetle, which basically looks like a lightning bug, but a little different colored. Mm -hmm. um, and they eat Salt, they're beneficial. They eat soft bodied insects, but they also require nectar and pollen mm -hmm. at some point. And so in their journey of eating soft bodied insects and kind of traveling around the garden, they're also pollinating. Right. So they're like multitasking. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, this could just go so deep and I just have to tell you all this. So I was reading through, you have to get her book because it's really a great read. Jessica's um, a really experienced, good writer. And on page eight, where she's starting to share how she came to love um, insects, because she, just like all of us, um, I mean, I used to spray pesticides a long, long time ago. You kind of come to this moment. She, I'm just going to read you um, actually these two sentences from page eight on her book, Slug Sex 
is interesting stuff. It's slimy, dangerous, and utterly captivating. It is also how I came to appreciate the insect world. So just discovering all the good bugs doesn't mean that the bad bugs don't have a great purpose too. And um, so Rhonda tell, so my, that's the book I'm going to highlight is both of Jessica's books, Good Bug, Bad Bug, Mm -hmm. which every home should have that book that's got a yard because something that Rhonda and I want you to take away, this is the whole highlight of the entire podcast, y'all. You don't ever squish or kill anything until you know what it is. Right, Rhonda? That is correct. ID first. And we want to say to you right now, as soon as you finish this podcast, we want you to put in a search engine, what is a baby ladybug larva look like? And I can promise you, I would guess from my years of conference talking and asking people when I show the picture of a baby larva, I'm talking about gardeners, growers, people that should know. I ask them to raise their hand. They do not know what it is. I can guarantee that 95% of baby ladybugs are squished and sprayed. Wouldn't you agree with that, Rhonda? Oh, for sure. And and that's the thing. Um, We tend to generalize lady beetles or stink bugs or flies. I mean, there are so many different genuses and species of each. Like, look at the ladybugs. I mean... There are she's tons she's of showing ladybugs. me pictures, y'all. I know. I'm showing you pictures. There There's like 16 on this page. <laughs> yeah, there are tons of ladybugs, and all of their larvae are different looking. So, I mean, there are some that are white and fuzzy and look like mealybugs, um, and they're called mealybug destroyers. They're out there eating the bad guys. So, really, you know, a lot of them look alike. Um, I mean, yeah. So, there are a lot of immature insects that eat different things than their parents, like hoverflies or surfid flies, their larvae eat aphids. So yes. yeah. Yeah. That's my book, real- I'm going to say my book is good garden bugs. Uh, everything you need to know about beneficial predatory insects by Mary Gardner. Gardner. She's at Ohio state. She came at, at it from, she's an entomologist where Jessica, I believe was a horticulturist first. Yes, so correct. it's interesting to see that from different directions, so. Well, and so um, Jessica's book, The Attract and Beneficial Bugs, is all about how they interact with the plants that we grow. And with that, I want to, just a couple of other kind of like scratch your head. Oh, is that why this is? So something I mentioned to Rhonda yesterday when I said, let's do this podcast. Um, I had just seen another reminder, which I knew this, but somebody always posts it on social media to remind everybody. Um, So what is one of the gazillion benefits of having leaf litter in your yard, in your garden? We use leaf litter as mulch in our pathways, major league. Um, What is one of the things that as a child, Rhonda and I are about the same age, we're both you know, at the 60 mark. So when we were kids, what did we see outside that was a major part of our play play in the dark? Oh my good. Lightning bugs, summer yes. and lightning bugs and jars. And, um, you know, and now you just don't see so many because their larvae, a lot of their larvae live in the detritus, the leaf litter underneath, you know, in the woods and in our yards and flower beds. Um, you know, that's where they live. There are a lot of moths that live there. There are a lot of beetle larvae that live there. A lot of caterpillar, um, yeah, caterpillar, butterfly caterpillar, That that's where they overwinter. So it's habitat. And, you know, the one thing I want to say, because I can already hear people's wheels turning, um, and something you said earlier about the process of having these insect soil workers that, you know, you poop, you know, poop is a big part of gardening life, y'all, if y'all haven't figured that out or not, but how it's so much better for the natural process to feed our soil. So there's people right now listening to this say, oh my gosh, I'm going to get leaves. I'm going to start this process. Everything takes time, right? You're not going to see this instantly. And I'm sitting here overlooking where our native border is that we started working on five years ago. And we're now just now starting. We saw immediate 
responses to planting this great native border on around our farm to encompass it immediately by all the birds that were in it. You know, that's like top level stuff. But now the trickle down, some of these things that we're talking about are starting to happen. So if you dump leaves in your garden, you're not going to overnight fix all your problems because you want to know what the number one question I get about when I talk about using leaves in my garden is, <laughs> am I going to have slugs? <laughs> and we people just can't get it that I understand about slug damage because in fact, in a shade garden that I have, we can fight slug pressure, but out in our big garden, I think there are so many predators that mm -hmm. live in our leaf litter that slugs are not a problem for us. We just don't lose plants. Right. Right. Yeah. There's just so many predators out there. Yeah, and I, thinking about the the small wasp too, the flowers that you plant, the diversity. There are a lot of small flowers. I'm thinking like dill, the ami mages, because those little guys have little itty bitty mouths. So exactly. uh, mountain mint is a really good one. But anything with itty bitty flowers um, that they can get into. So, and you know, we'd be amiss by not saying that you know all of this is great, but there's a couple of steps that you have to follow to start. I call it restoring nature. Um, which takes a couple of years to do um, after you go cold turkey. And what does that mean? Going cold turkey, we use zero pesticides on our farm. Um, and that even means we don't use organic pesticides. Um, I mean, isn't that the kind of the ticket, Rhonda, of the beginning of it all? Because everybody has a part in this chain of life. And right. when you eliminate part of it, it screws up the rest of the cycle, right? Right. And it, and it is hard to do. I mean, that, I think the beginning is observing your plants, seeing what's out there. Um, certainly, if you've got Japanese beetles, you can, you know, you can do something about it. What do you what do you do about your Japanese beetles? So that's a great question. Um, we started years ago using soapy water in a, depending on how much big a garden you have, um, in a mason jar with soapy water and just walking and putting it under the bloom, tapping it and dropping them and flushing them. Mm -hmm. um, and because every Japanese beetle we handpick eliminates, I don't know how many babies they have each year when they crawl into your soil and lay their eggs. But that's the way I think of it. Every Japanese beetle that I either squish, which is really kind of inconvenient and gross. That's why I just first job of the morning, I walk around the garden and tap and do it. But we only really would do something like that for serious bugs like Japanese beetles and, and like some, stink bugs, maybe. Yeah. And I mean, that's something that not much likes to eat those. So I mean, right. really, unless you're going to kill them with chemicals, uh, mechanical dropping them in the, in the water is definitely the way to go. So. And we have for sure seen our population. Um, I mean, we have a few, I mean, so what happens now? Japanese beetles adore um, marigolds and zinnias. Marigolds, I'll let, that's our trop, uh, we have a trap crop kind of. And what I mean by that is that's where I go first during Japanese beetle season, first thing in the morning, early, because they're all sleeping, y'all. It's amazing. There's pictures of this in my book, Vegetables Love Flowers. You walk up to the marigold and you see all these little black dots. Well, those are Japanese beetle butts sticking <laughs> out because they're they're going for the gold down in there. And so you can just shake all them right into your bucket. And then my next case would be to walk over to the zinnias. And we get so few so little damage on our zinnias now, um, it does make a big, big difference. So I think, um, you know, this is a talk that we could do this again and again, Rhonda, I'm thinking. Um, so giving up pesticides, step away from the trigger, identify first, mm -hmm. but today make the pledge to step away from pesticides. Um, and I will say it again, that less than 3%, I mean, and let's just, how many insects do you think there are in the world? Oh, goodness. I don't know. Millions, I would think. I, I, I think there's like 900,000 beetles. So, um, and now they're starting to think that the parasitoids out, I, I think there's, you know, because there's parasitoids that parasitize other parasitoids. Yeah. yeah there's a lot of things out there we don't know about. So 3% is a BB in the Astrodome, y'all. So what are the chances that something in your nard needs to be killed? And, you know, 
when I give the organ, how to garden organically, the big picture, first off, there's just some crops that I don't grow anymore because they're pest magnets. Right. There is far too much other stuff to grow that isn't a pest mag magnet and in fact attracts the good guys, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not any one thing, right, Rhonda? I mean, so what would your tip? My tip is no pesticides, which I know that's your tip too. Um, and to not grow buggy stuff. So what would you say would be a good um, kind of takeaway from a, somebody that hasn't stepped into this world yet? I, I think observing and, I mean, turning over leaves and looking to see what's there. Um, quite often when you see aphids, I mean, people freak when they see aphids and they spray them with water and squish them. And, but if you look in there, some, sometimes you'll see aphids that are brown and you can tell they're dead because they've been, they're mummies. Um, they've been parasitized by those wasp or, yeah, that's a wasp. Um, or there's something else in there like the surfeit fly larvae that's eating them or the ladybug larva that's in there too. So you really have to look and make sure everybody in there is a bad guy if you're thinking about squishing them or just waiting until those good guys do show up. I know it's hard, um, but that threshold of how much damage are they really doing and can I wait a little bit longer until the good guys come and just, yeah, it's hard, I know, but it's worth it when you see it happening and you see it working, I think it's worth it. But it's my so bottom exciting. dollar is, <laughs> my bottom dollar doesn't, uh, yeah, it's not a, a flower on a stem, unfortunately. So. But you know what, but you know what, I think too, Rhonda, so often, a lot of times, perhaps the damage we're perceiving is not really the damage from the, the the insect that we're seeing on there. We assume that that insect is causing that problem. Right. And in fact, it's either poor drainage, not the nutrition, it's not getting enough light. I mean, there's so many, you have to really step back and become a big picture thinker. And that's kind yeah. of, I think what I, I tend to not zero down on individual little problems, which is a fault of mine. But I stand back and it's like looking at the big picture and we would have to, we have to mention at this point, of course, Dr. Tallamy, his book, Bringing Nature Home, changed the way that I farmed. I guess that's been 10 years ago, maybe. Y'all, mm -hmm. um, there's just, there's just such a world out there that we just don't even know about. And this is far, this makes gardening like an adventure. <laughs> a horror movie, <laughs> um, so much different, wonderful stuff. And, um, you know, I want to just tell one more story and then we're going to um, wrap this up here. Do we have so, to? Huh? <laughs> Do we have to? <laughs> I know it's so true. We could really just talk and talk and talk. So one of the um, beneficial insects that um, there's three Let's see, what would my three be? Oh, so my three, when I used to give the talk, just trying to give people a snapshot of how much we don't know. For us here on our farm, three of our most ferocious helpers in the garden are snakes, eek for most people. I don't like snakes either, y'all, but they do an incredible job of rodent control, meaning voles. Um, spiders which people are terrified of. Um, we, in fact, if anybody has ever worked with our Kelly on an IT issue for a <laughs> course or something, Kelly was so terrified of spiders when she came to work on the farm 10 years ago. She can now, I mean, she had a, a true terror. She can now pick up a spider with a piece of paper and take it outside. She understands their value. Number three, which was my terror, wasps. Big wasps, the wasps that you see building nests up in your carport. So what do those wasps do? I'm going to tell you just a very quick story. Um, oftentimes when I would be working out in the garden, especially when I would be prepared on my tractor, going really slow, tilling or flail mowing, which means the tractor is moving at a really, really slow speed. And I have a tractor that allows me to take out a bed with beds on either side of my tractor still growing and blooming. And so how many times when I was, you know, and you're going really slow. So you're like looking at everything. You get a really close up top view. 
I witnessed on so many occasions of, it's like, oh my gosh, look, there's a wasp. What is he doing? What is he doing? (laughs) And literally, particularly at a certain time of year on many of our flowers, there are caterpillars that moths have laid their eggs on a flower bud and it sprouts into this little larvae, which is a caterpillar to most of us. And those wasps are picking up those caterpillars and carrying them off. I mean, it's like, I can remember stopping the tractor and again, jaw dropping moment for me. One of the biggest pests that we fought on this farm was that, in fact, problem on our sunflower crops. In fact, that was the last organic pesticide that we used to use years ago um, called BT. The brand name is Dipel. And um, I would use it if I had to, but we would spray our sunflower buds um, to take out those larvae because by the time your sunflowers open, there's a dirty spot on it. And lo and behold, you dig in and there is a caterpillar in there. Guess what we got to stop using when we gave up pesticides, started planting some native plants, stopped, you know, worrying about what was going on and letting nature take its course. I have videos of wasps working our rows of sunflower buds going from flower to flower to flower, Mm -hmm. looking for the caterpillars. I mean, y'all, this is real stuff, right? That was, I think that was my first one. The first time I'm like out there squishing asparagus beetle larvae. And all of a sudden I see a wasp land on the top of the asparagus frond and take this larvae. And I was like, yay. Um, Yeah. And it's, and it's mama's wasps who are just providing for their young. So they're taking those caterpillars home and laying an egg next to it and, uh, or in it. Yeah. And, and um, yeah, it's baby food. And so wasps eat meat. They're meat Mm -hmm. eaters, right? Right. I mean, they don't want to bite people y'all. They bite you when you mess with them, get in their way or you scare them just like we tend to lash out when we get scared. Oh my goodness. We could just talk about this forever. So um, we are going to put the list of books down below that we just find to be really, really helpful um, in this whole journey. And y'all, I hope that we have sparked um, a real interest. And um, I just, we just can't tell you how fun a journey this is. Rhonda, thank you so much. Okay. We'll talk next week. (laughs) <laughs> you know, we should. And so Rhonda is our warehouse manager. I didn't even really go into that. The way that Rhonda and I met um, is that years ago, she told me this morning, it was 2013. Um, we had a friends of the farm program and Rhonda was one of the people that came here kind of, they didn't realize that it was kind of for an interview because I knew there'd be a lot of people that wanted to come and help here on the farm. Um, and Ron, that's how Rhonda and I's relationship began all those years ago. And she worked here on the farm for a while and was it kind of in and out of our farm and pitcher, right? For several yeah. years. Right. And then when we, um, the business just started ramping up a few years ago, I told Suzanne, my sister, I wonder if Rhonda, I mean, she's like the one, you know, I mean, she has the knowledge of gardening and she uses all of our stuff. She sold blocks. You know what I mean? You were the whole package person. Suzanne said she doesn't want a job. And here we are (laughs) two years, right? We just hit two years um, of you actually being a part of an official part of the team. And we paid part, a paid (laughs) part. There you go. That's the word. Um, and so we really appreciate Rhonda and, um, all that she brings. And so friends, if you are loving this podcast, I'd love for you to, um, share it with your friends, share a review, let us know if you want to hear more about bugs. Um, I know that I get a lot of questions about bugs, about what we do when there's bugs on our flowers for harvesting, you know, we're flower farmers, right? That's kind of the bottom line around here. Um, but we'll let us know if you want to hear more. And um, so if you want to learn more about the work that the Gardener work, Gardener's Workshop does, head over to thegardenersworkshop.com where you'll find our um, online garden shop, our virtual learning center, all of our online courses where you can start 
flower-based businesses. If you're a home gardener for seed starting, a little cutting garden, or we'll help you dive into flower farming um, with our instructors who are just industry leaders, amazing people that have been doing it oftentimes for over a decade, really just sharing you um, the black and white truth of doing it um, and being there for you. All right, Rhonda, thank you so very thank much. Thank you. It's fun. I'll do it anytime. Okay. All right, friends, till we meet again. Ciao.